everything seemed to be a race issue, and I didn't understand why. It was always a black and white narrative. What about us in the middle? So my small personal family story actually helps me make sense of all these racial tensions in America. Yeah, I can see you steaming. Mm -hmm. But did your yeah. mom make soup too when you were growing up? Yeah, mom always makes soup, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What kind? Chinese soup? Hongzhou? Getting too old, I can't uh. remember. I, I like uh, Who made that? Mama. Where's our mother now? Huh? Where's our mother? She's in heaven. Oh, she is. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. My grandma had pretty bad dementia. It's interesting how memory works. It's like there are things we choose to remember and things we prefer to forget. It's like that in-between space on the bus. Grandma, did you ever take the bus? Where? In Georgia. No, we have a car. You drove a car. So my family did have mobility. They weren't exactly stuck like their economically disadvantaged black neighbors. See, when plantation life died out, there were no more commissaries, and so the Chinese opened up grocery stores to sell to the black community. Some Chinese were already in Augusta to build the canals back in the 1870s. But my family was part of a merchant class who moved to Georgia in the 1920s. At this time, the legacy of slavery still hung very heavily on the people. The Chinese slipped into this ambiguous space between two very different forces. One from above and one from below. Segregation was nothing more than a pseudo way of carrying on slavery. You couldn't have slavery by edict of the 13th Amendment, but let's do everything else except for the chains. And, and sometimes the chains were there as well because often in, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the chain gangs in the South were being full of African Americans for doing little of nothing. And a lot of that was sort of a residual effect from the end of slavery and, and the onset of these Jim Crow laws. But that being said, African Americans were very close knit during this time frame. You had black banks and black hospitals and the Lenox Theater and sort of interspersed with black churches and schools. African Americans did thrive in that setting, um, but there were still some shortcomings. Our stories originated from different places, under different circumstances. But the grocery store would become this interesting entangled space that created encounters and relationships between the two communities. They had all these cookies. They had the chocolate chip, the <laughs> strawberry with the creamy stuff. Cookies and pickles. <laughs> <laughs> they had these big jars of cookies, and they were like two for a penny you know, back in the day. They would send me with a note. You give it to him, and whatever was on the list, he'll bag it up and write you, and you sign a piece of paper and bring it back home. If you didn't have all the money, you pay him later. Oh, you would let us have it on credit. My mama wouldn't let me do it. I wanted to be a grocery boy, right? Oh, the big oh. bank. They hired guys, mostly guys, because they didn't want the guys to, to deliver their groceries. The store didn't just get anybody to work. He had to observe you. Mm -hmm. He had to know that you was okay. He had to know that you had some upbringing. My family was part of this tight-knit cluster of stores that grew into a thriving Chinese community. In 1935, Augusta had 46 Chinese-run stores. Just to give you a little perspective, Atlanta had only one Chinese-run store. Savannah had only five. So Augusta was pretty unique 